This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. This week on Meet and 3, we're foraging. From Prospect Park to an iPhone app, what does it mean to find our own food? We've recorded, I think, over 1,300 species of fungi occurring in New York City. You know, my ingredients are making themselves, and so that rather than having the stress of needing to source the things I need, I can just walk out my back door and I can have them. Foraging overall is born out of living with the land and with the seasons by Indigenous people. Tune in to Meet and 3, available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Pizza Quest. I'm Peter Reinhardt, a man on a never ending search for the perfect pizza. This show is the audio version of the Pizza Talk YouTube series, where I engage in interesting conversations with some of the country's greatest pizza makers and other artisans. Thanks for joining me on this quest. Hi, and welcome to Pizza Talk. I'm Peter Reinhardt. Pizza Talk's presented by Pizza Quest. And uh, it's interesting because the very first episodes, the webisodes that we ran on Pizza Quest when we launched it 10 years ago were with Nancy Silverton when she just shortly after it had opened Pizzeria Moza. So Nancy is with us today. It's great to see you again, Nancy, and thanks for joining us. And I think we're going to see you. Yeah, let's catch up today. I wish we were sitting face to face at Pizzeria Moza, but... Believe me, me too. <laughs> we're doing the next best thing. <laughs> it was one of my favorite stops on the whole journey. <laughs> and uh, and I know a lot has happened since then, and that's what we'll, we'll, maybe we'll spend a little time on, on this uh, first segment with you, uh, talking about, you know, everything that's happened from then till now, because you've opened some new places. I, I think that uh, when we were there, you hadn't opened Key Spaca, which is uh, the, the new concept that's around the corner, which is also, what, to go pizza to go, but also a restaurant right. at night. Yes. Uh, so what kind of restaurant is it at night? So at night, um, you know, it's one of those hard to define restaurants. When we first opened it, we thought of it as a butcher friendly restaurant because we were doing a lot of butchering, um, which we still do. But it was sort of a term that I feel got um, not only over uh, overused, but it also didn't capture what we really are because we have so many wonderful salads and vegetables as well so i don't know it's not an osteria in the sense that um most of the food is meant to be shared because it's larger format uh, which is not the case at the osteria we don't have any pastas it's not a, a pizzeria because we don't have pizza at kispaka in the dining room, we do have something called focaccia di Recco. I don't know if you know. I love what focaccia di Recco. We'll talk oh, about that a little bit. People who've never had, yeah. I wrote about it in uh, in my first uh, pizza with American Pie, and it was oh wow, it was, like, it was a highlight. I went to I went to Recco, and I got to you know to have it there, and I wrote about it. But uh, I, you never see it in the United States. I didn't know you were serving it. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, let me just finish a little bit about that corner, and yeah. then I'll come back to Recco if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the third restaurant that we're talking about started out as uh, a, uh, sorry, the space started out as a pizzeria to go. You know, we had so much interest in, um, in people wanting to take out our pizza at the pizzeria, but during prime hours, we couldn't accommodate, our oven wasn't big enough to accommodate it. Right. So space became available next, uh, two doors down, we took it over to do pizza to go. So there's, most of our pizzas, a few of our salads, a couple of our antipasti, lasagna, very simple things. But in that space, which was, it's quite large, we also ended up putting a small restaurant, which is called Kispaka, which the translation of is the person that cleaves, so the butcher. So uh, we used to describe it as a butcher-friendly restaurant, but it's much more than that because we have wonderful vegetables, great salads, things like that, but it's a tiny 40 seat restaurant that's open only at night. So like the, the butcher aspect of it is uh, meat, meat based dishes, obviously that are not, not something you wouldn't find at, at Osteria's Baco. Uh, Osteria. Larger format. So like tomahawk, uh, 
uh, you know, tomahawk pork and uh, bistec of Fiorentina and large uh, bone marrow pies. So most of it is sh is meant to be shared. So it's much more a um, a shared format than say an individually plated like the oster. So it's three casual, casual and fun. It is casual. There's no you know tablecloth, but it's not. Um, but it's still. Um, it's not a cheap restaurant, I, I have to say, but, um, but you know, I try to, in each restaurant, um, I, I, I found it very important to have that one, I want to come back dish, right? And at Key Spaca, that comeback dish is a focaccio di Recco. And, um, and I love the fact that you know it because most people I have to describe it to, and I will describe it because most people don't know and are very surprised buy it. Um, so uh, in putting together uh, Keith Baca and wanting to do something, I thought about doing a focaccia. I thought I was going to be doing the more traditional yeasted, say Genovese style right. that we all know. Yeah. And uh, one of my partners had suggested I go to Recco, which was the focaccia capital of the world. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go there. Uh, as I go to Italy twice a year. So on that next trip, I planned, I, I rented a place in Genoa because it's in Liguria. And I went out to Recco. Now, first of all, <clears throat> you've been there. I've been there. Recco was probably one of the uglier cities in Italy, right? Let's say it's not. You don't go there for any other reason than to have focaccia di Recco. Or they call it focaccia col formaggi there, so cheese focaccia. And, and and I think what made it so ugly was that it had gotten bombed a lot during the war. Yeah, it was it's still true. 40, 50, 60 years later, still being rebuilt. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's why. Um, <clears throat> so I went to the local bakery and I and I ordered a uh, well, it wasn't a slice; it was like a square, and it was very thin, and it was filled with a cheese. And I thought that's okay. But it was cold and it had been made, you know, earlier on. And, and I kind of left it at that. And I went on for lunch that day, not in, in, in Recco, um, in Portofino, I think. And I had to be chatting with a waiter. And I and they said, why are you here? And I said, I came here to try Focaccio de Recco. I came to the region. And they, and they said to me, have you been to Manuelina? Which is a restaurant there that claims to have started, you know, have, have, have been the inventors of focaccia right. of course i went there on my uh, way back to the hotel and there i had a true focaccio uh direco which was life-changing right. so especially it's, when you have it right out of the oven it's you know, yeah the it's, it has to be like eaten out of the oven. no but it's super thin there's no yeast it's made with flour olive oil flour olive oil what am I missing? It doesn't even have salt. I don't know. Water, flour, water, and olive oil. And uh, well, yeah, it doesn't have salt because you salt it afterwards. Uh, yeah. You stretch it as thinly as you would stretch a uh, strudel. Yeah, it's like phyllo dough or strudel. Yeah. And then it's you, you just blob in um stracchino cheese, which um is we know it more as maybe a crescenza cheese. It's a fresh cheese, um, a fresh cow's mouth cheese. It's aged just a bit, and that's the tricky part of being able to um, make it at home, although I have a very, very um, detailed recipe in my new book, Key Spaca, that was supposed to come out in February, which we've pulled to fall, but it's completely in there. And you can, you know, if you if you Google um, Manuelina Restaurant, there's a whole YouTube of them making it, and it's something you want to see. And it's baked in these copper pans that actually come from... Um, uh, not from uh, Liguria, but um, they're they're made in. Uh, I'll think for a second, but anyway, it's thinly stretched, blobbed with this cheese, baked in the oven. Immediately comes out, finished with olive oil, salt, cut up, and and served. And when Ruth Reichel first had it, and she's the only person that ever said the same thing that I was thinking, it tastes like matzah and butter. Yeah. It, it is really good. You know, it's completely simple, plain, and that's kind of that feeling, if you like matzah and butter. I love matzah and butter. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I hadn't even thought about that combo, but uh, what, what kind of blew our minds was 
my wife and I went there. We, we, we tried to go to Manuelina, right? It was our one day that we yeah. had a chance to take the train from Genoa down to uh, Recco. And, uh, and it's kind of on the coast. And like you said, we had to walk about a mile from the train where the train led us off to get to the restaurant. And it, it was closed. It was the one day of the week that yeah. they were closed. And there was somebody there and they said, sorry, sorry. And I told them what we had come. And they said, well, there's another place around the corner. And they sent us to the, I guess, maybe the second. It's kind of like Frank Pepe's and Sally's in New Haven. <laughs> It's like the other the other place that did it, and it was uh, and it was run by these twin brothers, uh, Primo and Secundo. <laughs> you remember? <yeah. laughs> I felt like I was in you know the big night, and and they had a wonderful restaurant. And we told them about why we were there and everything, and they took us back in the kitchen and walked us through the whole process. But and they said, okay, sit down, we're going to bring you some food. And they they brought out a pan that was like this big, uh, and we looked at each other. So there's no way we can eat this whole thing. And he says, don't worry, the other half is for the people at the table next to you. Yeah. But a- after we had eaten our half, we went, no, we went the whole thing. It was so <laughs> light. It was so, it went down so easy. And, and yeah. because the dough was so thin, it really didn't, it didn't fill you up that much. It just kept no. creating a craving for more. And, you know, you can buy those pans online on Amazon. Yeah? And yeah. Just, are they called, what do they call them? Do they have a special name or are they just called Focaccia? I can, go look, I can go look it up for you. <laughs> well, we'll let the folks who are watching, <laughs> or we'll post it if we, ever, if we can get the actual name. Because I know after today, maybe some people are going to start yeah, wanting I, to make it or some restaurants no, are adding on. Absolutely. I'll give you the link to where you can get these copper pans. And you really need them because the way the, the, the pan conducts the heat, yeah. obviously. The, the, the material but also the shape of it so it's not like a pie you can't do it in a pie tin with high sides you know it just has to be just a gently so sloping like one inch you know like not even an inch height so i'll, I'll give you know what i did my, my hack for that at home was to take a regular pizza pan like the kind of yeah. pizza pans you see a pizza right. rigos, which only slope a little bit up and then you crimp it all the way around the sides yeah. not the exact same thing that they did but it's a beautiful and and once you figure out how to make the dough, it's all not, not that hard. If you can get no. some soft, fresh cheese like Crescenza or, right. or uh, uh, what, what's what's the one you were describing that they use? Strachino. Strachino, yeah, which is yeah. sometimes you can see it, but it, it, yeah. by the time, if, it, yeah. if it's coming from Italy, it's not fresh anymore. You know? right. <laughs> so no, Actually, there's a local maker that makes it for us. That's He's, the way to do it, yeah mozzarella maker but they he it is sold sold commercially under Crescenza. yeah and even uh Belgioso, which is a large company that's who i'm talking that, about and i've used yeah. that to make it when i'm when i'm when we have people over i make that as sort of an appetizer course so, well we have another we have another link another commonality <laughs> yeah and 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 here's the thing when i when i, I mean i wrote that book 17 years ago i know uh, isn't that crazy ago, and i thought i thought it's only a matter of time before it starts exploding around the United States. I'm so excited to hear that somebody finally took it and ran with it and is making yeah, it happen. We, you know, um, I'll tell you a couple of people that are doing it, like Michael Tusk up at um, Catonia in San Francisco. San Francisco. He loves it, and so he does it also there. And um, uh, uh, Justin um, at um, Upland in New York, he was doing it. But you're starting to see it a little bit, you know? Well, I'm telling you, when everybody hears that you're doing it, oh, then they're okay. all going to do it. I got to tell you. you know. Well, I got to tell you, the recipe is like, you know, foolproof. And like I said, anybody can go on YouTube because it's there and it shows you exactly how to make it. Um, but but, you, well, you all heard it here. And again, yeah. you have YouTube because, yeah, if you haven't had it, which most of you probably haven't, uh, you're going to have to either make it or take a trek to someplace that it's doing it. Yeah. Right. Well, that's that's cool. So you So that's a whole new branch of the you know of the various restaurants that you've done yes. and, and when i saw you two years ago and that's the last time i saw you was at pizza expo and we did a panel right. together and you had mentioned that you were getting ready to open a roman style pizzeria yes did that open so, and, and is it happening it's opening and it's doing great and i'll tell you just about it because i don't like to assume all the credit when i uh do not deserve it so um the the principal owner uh, and chef is Matt Molina, who used to be our chef at uh, Pizzeria Mozza and Osteria Mozza. And before that, he was a line cook at Campanile. Campanile. So he's been with you for a long time. And we introduced mm-hmm. Matt to our followers through the videos that we shot, uh, the webisodes at Mozza when we Perfect. were there years ago. And he was kind of your chef de cuisine at, at Pizzeria Mozza at the time. Yeah, we so full, full circle. Um, he was ready to branch out on his own. 
Uh, he found a space with, along with partners uh, where they were going to have a small little osteria, which they have. Uh, uh, and um, and uh, with that, there was a space for a takeout pizzeria. So, and so he wanted to do something and he wanted my help. And I said, okay, look at Matt, I'll be, I'd love to help you work on the concept. Um, I don't think right now Los Angeles needs another Moza style pizzeria with me there because what would I do different? Although I do have a new concept. I just thought of it, which I have to tell you about. But anyway, oh, wow, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, hear that too. So, yeah, but- so, you know, the the idea for this, uh, for this, um, uh, for it's called Triple Beam, by the way. And the, right, the right. beam comes from the old fashioned way of weighing things where it has the beam, right? And you weigh because this pizza is, Rather than um, sold by the by the pie, it's sold by the slice. Not the slice, but again the, the piece, um, and it's weighed. But so, you know, the 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 beginnings of the conversation with Matt started five years ago. The restaurant's only a year old. So I have to say, just like you're talking about writing about. Um, uh, Focaccio di Recco 17 years ago. I'm not talking 17 years ago, but I am talking about before I knew of any Roman style pizza in the uh, United States. And I think that's the new craze, which is a style of pizza that not only a lot of people are doing it by the slice and wade, and it's pizza all'Italia, but it's also the style of, of the pizza where the crust um, is kind of. Um, Baked, yeah, very light, aerated, um, a little bit thicker than a a, a thin pizza, right? Uh, but then it is topped afterwards and goes back in the oven. And right. I've been going to, and I know you've gone to um, the Forno on the Campo di Fiore, oh, where that that beautiful pizza Bianca, uh, both topped and then they also make it into sandwiches. And um, that's what Triple Beam is. Um, I don't run it. Matt runs it. I just helped him develop the style and the recipe and the idea. But now I got to say, if I had to say what, if you were to say, look into the crystal ball and what do you see? We see Roman. style pizza. We see Detroit style pizza. You know, we see the yeah. next phase of what we were doing with just our personal style of round traditional pizza that wasn't necessarily Neapolitan. So Right, right. It's it's amazing how many different iterations pizza can have and how great yeah. it can be when it's done well. And I think that's the Roman pizza has kind of burst on the scene. Uh when we when I saw you two years ago, did you get a chance to go to the booth at Pizza Expo from the, the folks from the Roman Pizza Academy that were displaying all of their various pizzas? Who was baking at it? I may have Massimiliano Saiva. Yes. And, and and we're going to have them on on Pizza Talk too. Massimiliano and his partner Alex uh, Monzo, they're going to come and talk about that. I was blown away by that, and I and I haven't been to Rome since since Bonchi opened his, so I haven't been to Pizzarium. So yeah. I don't know. That's kind of considered sort of the gold standard. That's the yeah. Magdalena of Roman style, but but that's and his is a lot. His is a lot thicker, Bonchi, and he's doing that in Chicago, and he's opening up in New York. He's got I think two places in Chicago. Right. I think going to New York, the one it, at the um, in, uh, that's owned by the Roscioli family in the Piazza Campo di Fiore in Rome yeah. is much thinner, but it's not crispy like a cracker. You know, it yeah. still has the dough structure, yes. but it's a lot thinner. So I say um, uh, bone cheese is much more almost focaccia. Exactly. Yeah, I think of it as a focaccia variation, or what would be associated with focaccia. Yeah, yeah and, great topic. And, and now people are calling it um, pinchy. That's yeah. That's another one. Pinchy. Which yeah. I think is still Roman style. I mean, it's still the same. Um, it's still the same thing where the dough is baked. It's a light dough, right? Um, but it's very light and airy. It goes super back airy. in, right? So super airy. And, and Sometimes I, think, I get I get confused by all these names and well, that's it. And I was wondering about that name too. Is, you know, a name can mean something in Italy, and then by the time it gets to the United States, it 
it takes on the name, the meaning of whatever we give it. So somebody will say, oh, it's, it's pizza style pizza. And it may not be anything like what you would see in, in Italy or Rome. But uh, I was told that what that term meant was the shape. It's almost more of an oval shape. Yeah. So it refers to this. It's basically an oval version of a pizza. Yeah. 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 So that's, you know, I mean, they're all the same. Like there's a, you might want to talk to this guy in Los Angeles. Um, he has a pizzeria called Apollinaire. And um, and I met him, you know, every year as part of um, a L.A. food festival, they have a pizza segment, right? And they have, I don't know, 20 vendors and some panels and things like that. Um, and last year, a little adorable girl came up to me and said, would you try my daddy's pizza? I'm like, sure. Oh, gosh. To me, right? Best marketing tool in the world. <laughs> right, cute. And she brings me this, this um, focaccia-looking pizza. And sometimes that's not what I want, the breadiness of it. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, sure. So I taste it. It was so delicious, as light as could be. I went up and met her father. And he tells me, and this is the first time I ever heard of it, Detroit-style pizza. He called it Detroit-style. Okay. Yeah, so it has the cheese on the outside, and it's baked in a sheet pan. But his is so light, as if I never had Detroit-style pizza. So what's the difference between Detroit-style pizza, Chicago deep dish, focaccia, the bonchies? I mean, is, is it all the same? I have no idea, right? It all has a different name. That's one of the reasons why we have, we're doing Pizza Talk is to really explore yeah. all of these, these styles now that have exploded on the scene and do have, they take on different meaning in different parts of the country. Uh, Detroit style is no longer owned by Detroit. It's been around for 65, 70 years, and now all of a sudden it's become the hot overnight you success. No, I mean, this guy's is delicious. His name is Justin, and he's from Apollinaire. I would talk to him. I love we'll it. Down. Maybe we can get him on. Yeah, and because, boy... Yeah, there's a lot it, going on. When it's done well, it's, I mean, it is my favorite current style right now. And, and the last book that I did, uh, Perfect oh, wow. Pizza, it was really built around my version of a Detroit style pizza. I, I added my own little twist to it. And I'm, I'm pretty, pretty jazzed about it because it, it brings together the best part of focaccia and pizza for me, which is a, <laughs> a wonderful undercrust with kind of a, a, a buttery, uh, you must talk to him then. Yeah. You know, again, I've never had it before, so maybe maybe what I'm having is not a great version. I think it's still. I mean, well, I'll, probably is. But uh, when I when I can get on a plane again, when that happens, I, I'm you yeah. know, LA is on my. I've got to get back because there's so many things that have happened since I was last there. So you want to so, hear about my new concept? I, I want to hear, but why don't we why don't we save that for the next segment? Because we've okay. we've about, just about run out of time here. But oh. what we're going to do is invite everyone to join us for part two with Nancy okay. Silverman, so we can play more catch up. We've been catching up a little bit on the last ten years. Uh, I want to go back even before then and talk a little bit about sort of again your culinary roots, a little bit of the history. But then sure. let's talk about the future of not only the future of pizza, but the future of Nancy Silverton and where you see things going. We'll be right back with more Pizza Quest, right after this break. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. 
Let's welcome everybody back to join us. Uh, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and it, this is Pizza Talk, presented by Pizza Quest. And we're with Nancy Silverton, part two. And if you missed our first segment with Nancy, uh, it, it's already posted, so go look at it. It's everywhere. It's on It's on our site. It's on Instagram. It's on Facebook. It's on YouTube. Um, and so um, and we're, we're reaching more and more people, you know, through these uh, Pizza Talk interviews with folks, because we're really trying to find out, number one, what some of the great luminaries in the pizza and artists and foods industry are are doing during this sort of, I call it the COVID age, and everybody's having to pivot and figure out what they're doing. Nancy, in part one, told us a little bit about the pivots that, that uh, Pizzeria Moltz has made and what's open, what's closed. Uh, we were talking about your new place, Key Spaca, where you can get pizza to go, and that's it's still going. New, it's like eight years old or something. But. Uh, new, new to me, because I, okay. I haven't been there. <laughs> And then, but now uh, it, it's now also a restaurant. And so we got uh, we got uh, totally consumed with our passion for uh, focaccia col formaggio di Recco. For, focaccia with cheese from the town of Recco, basically is what it is, which is really kind of like a cheese strudel that, that's right. crisp on the outside and the underside. And it's like butter when you bite into it. Like mozza, let me see, like mozza butter, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a great description. So, so we're not going to talk too much more about that. Go back to that segment. And also, please, if you're watching... Go back to the uh, webisodes we, we filmed at the Pizzeria Moza and at Osteria Moza yeah. 10 years ago. And you'll get to see us doing some sampling with Nancy. We'll meet Matt Molina, her chef de cuisine, who is now running his own place. Uh, is Triple Bean the, the place that, that, uh, yeah. that Matt's running? Yeah, so Hippo is his restaurant. It's on, it's on the same, uh, they share a little courtyard. So it's Hippo is the restaurant and the, the pizza is... Uh, Triple Beam, and there's actually two locations, Highland Park and um, Eagle Rock. Oh, great. So that's, and that's Roman style. So we talked a little yeah. bit about Roman style, which we, we see as maybe one of the big coming trends. Yeah. Uh, and we'll be talking with some, some people who are doing that style. We talked about Detroit style pizza. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Nancy told us that is, uh, she told us about a place in LA that she's, she's heard of, uh, Apollonia. Is it uh, Apollonia? Apollonia. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna find. We're gonna try to track down find, the find from there so we can get him to come on sometime. But let's let's talk a little bit. I'd love, like to go back uh, a little bit and 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 kind of catch people up because almost everybody knows who you are now. Yeah, they've seen you on Netflix and they've seen you on PBS and and on Top Chef. Every you're everywhere and you've been you know um, a leading. I would say you know uh, a thought leader in the culinary uh, community for a long time now. Uh, we first. Our, we, we didn't meet back then, but we were living, I think, in Sonoma County. I think you were at the college at Sonoma State, right? Yeah, and, good and, memory. And, so I'd love to maybe get, uh, just very quick, like a little breeze through how you went from being a college student in, in Sonoma <laughs> State, not even knowing what you were studying, and then, you know, kind of sucked into the culinary revolution that was happening in Northern California. Right. That, that then catapulted you down to Southern California. I just first have to ask you a question. Did you ever used to eat a brass-ass pizza? I've heard of it. I'd heard of it, but I never knew. No, I never uh, got to eat it. Was that, in, was that in in uh, Santa Rosa? In, Sa in Santa Rosa. Yeah. Well, that's where I live, but I never. No, I don't think. I think it was closed by by the time I got my bakery going up in Santa Rosa. Okay. <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't, I don't remember that one. But, um, um, so you know, real real quickly, I fell in love with an event an adventure winemaker actually who still lives in. Uh, uh, well, now lives in Napa, but he was the, uh, a cook at the college, at Sonoma State College dormitory. I told him how much I'd love to cook, which I had never cooked before. Uh, and I come work in the kitchen, and I started to work in the kitchen. And I just fell in love with the, whatever, the process of food. Because look, at I was uh, at that time making things like, I was the vegetarian cook, so I was making little loaf. And um, and melted cheese sandwiches and peanut butter and sunflower seeds, whatever the hippies at Sonoma State wanted to eat then, right? But this I, is beginning to sound a little bit like the a little bit like the Ruth Reichel. Yeah, it, 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 it was very Reichel, similar. Story. And it all similar. starts with falling in love with somebody, right? It, it starts <laughs> with falling in love. It fall. It's it it ends up finding a passion, and I just loved using my hands. And I think I loved just the feedback. When somebody looked at me and said, I loved, I felt loved, you know? So with that, I dropped out of school in my senior year and I ended up working uh, for free um, 
at a restaurant in Marin County called 464 Magnolia. Ah. And, uh, it was a run by a college educated husband and wife team. They were self-taught. They cooked out of cookbooks. They were interesting and smart, and it was very much like the community at Chez Panisse, I think, without them even knowing Chez Panisse. So everything was sourced locally. My job was to pick up the ducks at Petaluma Processing Plant in um, Petaluma. Petaluma I, duck, yeah. Right, they bought, yep, they bought only California wines. We used to go up to Napa and Sonoma when it was not even uh, a thing. Um, the menu changed every night. Um, and while I was there, I signed up to go to cooking school at the Cordon Bleu in London. I didn't even know that there was a cooking school in the United States, the, the Culinary Institute in Hyde Park, which is fantastic. I thought, I want to go to cooking school. I have to go to Europe. I went to cooking school. I came back. Um, I moved back to Los Angeles, and I got my first job at Michael's Restaurant in Santa Monica, which was the restaurant of the time. It was, yeah, that was a phenomenal place. Yep, Jonathan Waxman was the chef, um, and I, that's where I really honed my skills. I was put into the pastry department, and I didn't want to be there, but that was the only opening in the kitchen. I started working with a crazy, brilliant, young pastry chef, and I learned to love pastry. I didn't bake bread there. I, mean, I did brioche. That was it. Uh, quickly, I went on to Spago. Uh, I, opened, I was the opening pastry chef at Spago with Wolfgang Puck. I was actually there twice. I was there for two and a half years, went to New York for a year, came back to Los Angeles to look for my own restaurant, came back to Spago, and that's where I started to make bread a little bit, but I didn't really know that much about it, um, and started to look for uh, my own restaurant with my then husband, Mark Peel, uh, and I always knew that if I found a place that was big enough to accommodate a bakery, I wanted to make bread to complement the food at our restaurant, because at that time, there weren't the neighborhood bakeries to buy a good loaf of bread. Um, uh, found a location, taught myself how to bake, and sort of the rest is really history. You know, um, I was lucky, I have to say, because I was at the right place at the right time. You know, had I opened my bakery slash restaurant today, obviously the competition would have been a lot tougher. But this was something so new to Los Angeles, the idea of a bakery cafe, the idea of a bakery that made the loaves of bread that I wanted to make. It was all so new. We're talking 1989 it opened. Yeah. And, and it's kind of interesting how, uh, you know, uh, I always tell people that you sort of have to follow the breadcrumbs. You can't always, you, you have an idea of where you want to go, but sometimes you have to follow the breadcrumbs to where they lead you. And in this case, you know, you got led into pastry, uh, you know, maybe, unexpectedly and yes. it opened up this whole other world which then opened up another bigger world and you just yeah. kept gobbling it up and you know assimilating it and then then the creativity kicks in yeah you know i'm a just I'm, I'm i'm a true believer that everybody is born with a path and it's following that path you know so i mean if i didn't go to sonoma state college and fell in love with a Zen Buddhist, I didn't even know what Buddhism was then, right? And decided to work in the kitchen. I mean, all that. You were in the right place at the right I was time. Already in, I was already in my DNA, you know, and yeah, I, actually, yeah. you know, just being open to it. It's like you said, and I think it's a beautiful way to say it. Follow those breadcrumbs, right? Because they're going to lead you somewhere. Exactly. And, and sometimes uh, you know, the path may zigzag, but eventually you find the way. Yeah. And, uh, and it leads to, if you, if you stay true to it and, and, uh, right. uh, and essentially fulfill the opportunities that are right in front of you in that moment, they lead to other opportunities. hundred percent. Well, so, so that brought you into, you know, and Campanile was a, again, a groundbreaking restaurant. Uh, right. and I remember, uh, that's where I first met you in person yeah. was there because I had just done my first bread book. Somebody took me there to meet you. Yeah. You, right. were, you had opened the bakery side and, um, and, and then, and then, the next time we, you know, connected was when you had expanded La Brea Breads into a much bigger operation. And we're right. basically uh, serving the whole city and the area. of the world. The, and then the world. And then the world. Yeah, I mean, it went from <laughs> this to that path, you know. Yeah. And, and so, again, one thing le leading to another. And then uh, a few years later, all of a sudden, I'm hearing about this uh, amazing pizzeria in L.A. that you were doing, uh, Pizzeria Moza. And when we started filming for Pizza Quest, that was our very first stop. You know, you were the first place yeah. we went to. And uh, uh, 
You know, again, you. you were talking earlier in, in our earlier episode about a life-changing pizza at, uh, at the, the uh, Focaccia Col Formaggio in Recco, kind of like as an aha moment. Right. And I think what you were doing with pizza was, again, you had taken the idea of pizza that everyone was loving and Pizzeria Bianco had already kind of gotten on the map. And, right. and you said, okay, how can I do it and stay true to me, my vision, and then take it to another level? And I think you really pulled that off, so, which is, you know, those pizzas are conversation stopping pizzas and the whole restaurant oh, okay. is great. So anyway, that's then that's when we film. And then in, in between, I get to see you here and there. And then I see you on television a lot, you know, so the world has opened up. <laughs> um, so um, what uh, are you doing? Any cooking at home at all during this period? So I did at the beginning. So I um, when, uh, you know, Los Angeles restaurant, the Re Los Angeles restaurant world essentially um, came to a halt, meaning dine in restaurants on March 15th um, and orders from our mayor. We could, uh, 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 food operations that, that, that had a to go option where people, where food could be picked up or delivered. That was okay to stay open, but all dine in restaurants shut down. So I locally, I mean, locally, I luckily had that to go component already established. So I shut down the pizzeria and I shut down Osteria, but I had my mozza to go and I shut down Kisvaka. Uh, and that we were able to operate for two weeks. Uh, unfortunately, during that time, I did contact, contract the virus. Oh, you did? You got it. So I had, I did, but you know, thank yeah. you, stars, zero symptoms. I only went in for testing because somebody that worked there was tested positive and I knew that I needed responsibly, I needed to be tested because I was serving food. I had to shut everything down and everything shut down um, for about a month. And we just reopened two weeks ago with a more expanded menu. Um, and reopening was like opening a restaurant again. You know, all the disorganization, all the yelling and screaming, all the, all the things that go wrong when you first open a restaurant, you know, and I just feel like after two and a half weeks, we're finally going, getting over that hump, but I am there every day, you know, uh, involved and supervising and tweaking recipes because look at, let's be honest, food in a box is not the same as food on a plate. Right. You've got to make the changes so that hopefully when the food arrives at somebody's home, it's as good as it can be, knowing that it's in a box, closed up, you know. So that's what I'm really working on. When we did close and I, went, and I was home for a month, um, I did cook at home. And I don't ever cook in Los Angeles. You know, I have a beautiful little house, tiny little house in a beautiful little town in Italy. And I'm there every summer and I cook there all the time. Um, every day, and I have huge parties. But in Los Angeles, I don't cook at my house, Be except for backyard parties where I use my grill, and they're really simple parties. But I don't cook indoors in my house because I have got the restaurant, you know. Right. Um, so I did cook. I braised a lamb shoulder, and I slow grilled lamb leg, and I braised chicken thighs, and I baked um, tiny marzipan cakes, and I did bake, and I made omelets, and. Um, uh, and so I did bake and I did cook uh, more than I had ever for about a month, but I'm not cooking again. But this leads me to uh, my next question, which is in the previous segment, you mentioned and you kind of teased us with the fact that you have a new restaurant concept. Yes, so, I got to talk about it real quickly because I know that. I think everyone wants to hear about it. I know everything you want. Yeah, I know you have a lot to talk about, but I am opening up a small concept in a small food court. So the food court is only about 10 operators and mine will be called Pizzette. So it's a small pizza. Um, I'm opening, um, oh, so it's in an area in Culver City, which is booming with new office uh, spaces, opening up thousands and thousands, like, you know, Amazon and Sony and, um, uh, I mean, thousands of offices are 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 coming there. Not, uh, but you know, huge operations. Anyway, the, I think the the wave of the future are people that go out, bring their food back to their desk, they sit at their computer, and they eat. 
So you can't have a big pizza box, nor do you necessarily want to eat, even though our pizza are, are smaller than family size, you know, it's still a lot to eat. So these are pizzette, they're small pizza. But the part that I'm really interested, or I'm excited about doing, is I'm doing stuffed pizzette. But the stuffed pizzette are not going to be calzone. Uh, so they're not going to be baked. I'm just taking that baked size of the pizzette and uh, baking it just plain. Then I'm opening it up and using it in just in familiar terms like a pita. And I'm developing a whole range of sandwiches that you stuff from above. Uh. And what I'm excited about is that it's a new way of tasting a sandwich, not a new way because we know falafel sandwiches have been around forever and, 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 and pizza style sandwiches, but using my ingredients in that same format where when you make a traditional sandwich, let's say you're going to make it on a baguette or so, you know, everything is layered uniformly. So every bite tastes the same. And you may like that. Mm -hmm. or you might like the experience of every bite tasting different because it's stuffed in a different way. Yeah. Uh, and to me, that's an exciting new way to eat a sandwich because First of all, you don't get bored. Second of all, you don't want to share it because you don't know what that bite is you're going to miss. When it's, going to... <laughs> so, it's not a shareable food. It's a, no, it's it's a, a yeah. stay away, let me have my sandwich. <laughs> and it's not a messy food because it's contained in that shape. So pizzette and stuffed pizzette, that's it. Oh, oh, I love it. So you have, but you're going to have both an op a, a regular pizzette, like a small pizza plus small the pizza plus the sandwich. So for the stuffed one, are, you take basically the pizzette dough and bake it with nothing on it so it puffs up like a pita? Yeah, I dimple it so it doesn't puff up too high. Uh -huh. It's dimpled. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, again, it's opened up, and then it's all stuffed from above. So yeah. it oh, yeah. looks like a big sandwich because it's, you know. Yeah, yeah. But really, what's inside the filling would be less than you would eat in a traditional sandwich because let's suppose it's mortadella. Uh, it's it's going to be all rumpled. It's full of air, you know. It, it, it takes up volume. But once you you eat it, it's not it's not like it has a half a pound of meat in there. Well, and what you described uh, about each bite being different, I always, I call those flavor bursts. I think that I'm a big fan of foods that have flavor bursts, and, yes. and so and so a lot of what makes a sandwich, you know, a sandwich so popular and such a perfect food, just like the way the pizza is a perfect food, is is that is that there are these bursts every every bite, whether it's the crust, whether it's the topping, whether it's the yes. cheese. And things are squirted, you know, you know, kind of squirted in or spooned in, you know. So let's suppose it's a tuna sandwich that has, you know, braised tuna and it has egg in there, but it'll also have spoonfuls of um, black olive tamponade and other spoonfuls of a caper and anchovy mayonnaise, you know, everything you want to eat with the tuna sandwich, but not totally incorporated so you're going to have that bite of the tapenade and then later on the caper and anchovy mayonnaise and then some egg and then some tuna so that's, that's, that's I, really so a you'll idea. have to come visit me there when you get now, on that I, I guess we don't know because of the current situation when you can open places do you have an opening date in mind well you know what it can open because it's going to be to go and 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 the only reason it's not open and it was supposed to open like like february is to march is only because construction is always behind. It's yeah. been worked on along with the rest of the food court. It, and the food court, by the way, it's going to be called Citizen. And it's in, um, and that was the name of the newspaper that the building, that the previous, that was the the, the town newspaper, you know. I see. And, I see. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I'm sorry, what else is cool about this idea is, is that it's very scalable. Once you've got that template, you can do this in airports. You can do it in... Oh, airports. you got it. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're already way ahead of me on that one, I'm sure. Yeah. But it is the perfect, you know, kind of airport. It's kind of like what Rick Bayless did with his uh, with his Frontier sandwiches with the... Uh, you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love. I can't wait for that to happen. I can't wait for my local airport to, you know, happen as well. Or, but yeah. But, uh, but are you using, did you have to create a special dough for that, Nancy? Yeah, I, you know what? I did, I, it's, it's interesting. I took my pizza dough and I changed my pizza dough to accommodate the sandwich. And now I have a new pizza dough that you wouldn't notice. You wouldn't say, have you changed the dough? But I did. I added some spelt to it. 
and I added some olive oil to it. I need it to be a little bit softer. And I yeah. also added rice flour, so it's a little bit more extensible. Wow. Yeah. So my new pizza dough, which I purposefully did not want anybody to say, hey, the dough doesn't taste like it did, but it makes it more usable for the pizzette comp, uh, compote. And I don't, I, and I don't have to um, have two doughs. So like what would be a typical dough ball weight for either the sandwich or the pizzette? How, how big is the dough itself? So the pizzette, so my dough weight for my pizza is pizza meaning at pizza, pizzeria mozza okay. is seven ounces. My dough weight for pizzette for both the sandwich and the dough is four ounces. Four ounces. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So it's really a personal size pizzette yeah. or, or sandwich. Well, uh, I would love to keep talking for hours and hours. If we, if we can get you back, if you don't get swamped with all the other things as, as, every, as the world's reopening, no. I'd love to have you come back uh, for sure. a future episode, Nancy. And, love it. It's and, always and, a pleasure to talk to you. And you know what? Going- it's so great to talk to somebody that knows what they're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's more about sharing the passion. People who, who we love the same things, you know, and you... Yeah. And, you just, and, and, and look, there's lots of, we all know there's lots of podcasts and things out there where there's uh, the interviewer is, you know, as well-read and everything, doesn't live it. But see, you live pizza, I live pizza, and so yeah. we can pizza. Uh, exactly. And uh, we're going to post on, on pizzaquest.com uh, for anyone who, who is watching it there or comes over to our website, uh, we'll post the, the link to the, those pans, the copper yes. pans that Nancy right. talked about in the previous segment. And Nancy, Nancy Silverton, thank you so much for being thank with you. us today. We'll, so fun. we'll look forward to, uh, to the opening of Pizzette yeah. and, and for all the other future projects that you do. Thanks so thank much. Thank you. Have a Bye-bye. great day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Pizza Quest is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org, and connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Thanks for listening.